Welcome to everyone who's tuning in. We're going to start in momentarily. Just want to say Happy New Year to everyone. And I'm really excited about this Bible study tonight. If you have a discernment on where the church is and you understand the types of attacks that are happening in folks' lives, then you will understand the importance and the impact of what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, the devil always, the enemy, our sinful flesh, our propensities always lead toward, watch this, self-preservation. And in order to have self-preservation, if the enemy cannot deceive you into sinning and doing all kinds of things that will mess up your walk, he has a readily available tool and that is to get us to be in conflicts and disagreements with one another. Oh, you need this study tonight. I'm going to be talking about tonight how Christians should fight and handle conflicts. Call somebody up, text them. I have a lot to get in, into tonight, but this study will help you because all of us have to deal with the things in our lives, the situations in our heart where we find ourselves in disagreements with other people. How do we resolve those disagreements? Um, why is there fighting in the church? Why do believers who are so anointed find themselves annoyed with or getting in trouble with in their relationships with other believers? How do they get to the place where they can't resolve their issues and how do they understand what God says about the way that we as believers are, suppo are supposed to fight and interact with one another? You better get it through your head that there, the Bible tells us that we will have disagreements that must need come. All of us have found ourselves in a situation where we needed to learn what God said about how I keep my heart clean and how I do what God is asking me to do. So tonight, this is going to be a powerful study. I'm just waiting on people to get on. Please text someone right away. Share this to someone right away. Hit someone right away. We're going to be talking about one of the most deadly tools that the enemy is using. And that is to separate us, divide us, to get us into fights right there in the church. You can have just come down from an anointed experience where you feel like you are strong and all of a sudden you'll find yourself in a position, you walk out the house, you and your wife are arguing. You walk out the church, as soon as you do, another thing will come up that blindsides us and gets us into problems with one another. So we're going to talk about how do Christians fight and handle conflicts. I got to tell you, first of all, please understand that believers do fight. So how do we fight and handle our conflicts? How do we know that what I'm doing is pleasing God? Everybody finds themselves in a position sometimes where my own self-preservation or, or my own pain or my own situation or my well-being is more important than someone else's well-being. Well, that is a trick of the enemy. You better grab this now while you can. We're going to talk about how should you fight? And I do know this. Almost getting ready to start. We got a few people still coming on. I do know this. And that is all of us have the propensity and sometimes finds ourselves, especially no matter what your title is, we find ourselves in a position where we are in disagreement with one of our brothers and sisters, spills over into the church. Sometimes the church is having difficulties because nobody can get along with each other. Sitting right there two seats down, praising God up here, and then can't stand my brother sitting next to me. How do we find ourselves constantly in conflicts and what does God think about it? Oh, you're going to love the Bible answer for how we deal with this. First, we're going to pray right now. Father God, we thank you for giving us a heart of understanding, giving us a heart that trains our soul to be obedient unto you. We thank you now to God that we know your church is the place where people are supposed to find peace, safety, joyous relationships. And yet from the beginning of time, the enemy has come in and caused divisions and problems 
and quarrels and fights. And sometimes it's the very officers of the church that are fighting with one another. How does God say, what does the Bible say about how we as believers should fight and make sure that we handle our conflicts properly? I ask you to bless me now, God. Bring back to my remembrance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, what is God's belief concerning conflicts? What is God's belief concerning you being in conflicts? How do we handle that? We're, we're a gift to the Bible, to the body of Christ. We're a gift to God. And yet, the church still has conflicts. I'm going to start this out so you understand me directly. I'll start it out with asking you a question. And I want you to answer. That's how you'll know this lesson is for you. First of all, have you ever been hurt in the church? You can put it in the chat if you want to. But I know... It's going to be in the affirmative. Have you ever been hurt in the church is my question. Uh, I don't know how long you've been in the church, but I need people to understand the enemy is trying to use that hurt to divert us from our blessing. But watch this. Have you ever been hurt from the church in the church? OK, I'll just answer that for everyone. Maybe you're one out there who just by some manner have nobody said a negative word. Nobody said anything to you. Nobody brushed by you and insulted you. But for the most part, we all can answer yes. I guess some of you are saying, yeah, pastor, and you were the one that hurt me. Cut it out. <laughs> Let's go on with this lesson. The second question I want to ask you, have you ever been involved in a conflict in the church? Sometimes just in the groups you work in. Sometimes just in, may not be the whole entire church. We're going to talk about that because there's such a thing as intra conflict and inter-conflict. Maybe there's a conflict just in the sound room. There's a conflict just in the choir. There's a conflict just on the usher board. There's a conflict among the ministers. That's called interpersonal conflicts. We're going to talk about that. So we're going to look at those, but have you ever been in a disagreement, an argument, or a debate with another church member? And how long did it last? That's another thing. Sometimes they can last a long time. And what were the results? You know, the craziest thing in the world is sometimes our results are more worldly than godly because our results are to say, I'm just not going to talk to that person anymore. I'm going to stay away from them. Or sometimes we'll even go into a position where we tell other people not to talk about that person. And that's when we go into the escape, what I call, where we go into either a detrimental uh, comments about the person's character, trying to get someone else to help you with the pain that you're feeling right or wrong. And you find yourself in a position where God still did not get glorified. Now, here's the other question I'll ask you as I go into this teaching. Have you ever hurt someone in the church? Aha. Uh -huh. Come on, answer that question. You answer the other ones. Have you ever hurt someone in the church? Put it in the chat. Answer it tonight. Because we're going to talk about this thing. We're going to see how God is going to set us free from all of this division and all these fights and all this struggle within the church. So if you ever, so the questions to start this lesson out are the questions that I ask you is, have you ever been hurt in the church? Answer yes or no. Have you ever been involved in a major conflict, maybe within the group within your church? And, and lastly, have you ever hurt someone in the church? First of all, you need to know that from the we can find many, many examples in the Bible of where conflicts are in the church. It gets me when people are saying, you know, the church is so holy. We're so holy. We, we, don't, we don't deal in conflicts and struggles. That's not true. We're also human beings. I want you to go to Genesis chapter 3. And, excuse me, chapter 13. Uh, I'm going to be reading starting with verse 3. If you go to Genesis 13, let me turn to it while people are still coming on. Go to Genesis chapter 13. Been a long time since I did a, a Bible instead of my uh, my phone. So we'll start at verse five, I guess. It's Genesis thirteen, verse five. You got it. I'll read this for you. I'll start from verse uh, one and go down. So Abraham went up from Egypt to the Negev, and his wife and everything he had. And Lot went with him. That's important. Lot went with him. Watch this. Abraham had become very wealthy in livestock and silver and gold. Now get this. Abraham was, was the person who God chose to lead his chosen people. And here he is now going out as the father of faith. 
he left the Negev and went from place to place until he came to Bethel, right? To a place between Bethel and Ai where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. There Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now watch this. Verse 5 starts our conflict. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. Now these are saved folk. These are people that know the Lord. They're, they're God-chosen people, right? But verse 6 says, but the land could not support them while they stayed together, right? For the possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. Here it is, verse 7, and quarreling conflicts arose between Abram's herders and Lot's herders. Understand, the Bible is showing us you can be godly, you can be going on a godly quest, you can be anointed as Abram was, and yet as soon as he started moving out for God, there was conflicts. You want to see another one? Go to Acts chapter 6. Come on, we're going to go through the Bible. Go to Acts chapter 6 real quick. Acts chapter 6. Just going to read the first few verses. Acts chapter 6. Are you ready? It says, And in those days, that's how you know you had the right text, when the number of disciples were increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained about the Hebraic Jews. I'm reading NIV. Because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Wait a minute. The Holy Ghost had just fell. Everybody was anointed, speaking in tongues, and they're fighting about food. Can somebody say we fight about the craziest things? They were fighting about food. We can get in a disagreement with somebody and it can alter or divert the, the walk God had for us. You can be in a problem. You can get a problem or a struggle with somebody in a certain church or somebody in a certain group. And it'll stop you from using the gifts that God has given you. That's why Christians need to know, how do I fight? Please understand, conflicts are going to come. I'm not saying you're a bad Christian because you're in conflicts. I've had conflicts. Don't let any preacher tell you they have not had conflicts. We all get into conflicts. That's not the question. The question is, what do we do with the conflicts? Look what happened. In that text, it says they, the Hellenistic Jews were against the Hebraic Jews. All it says in that text was the Hebraic Jews are those who held on to the laws of of Judaism, right? They were the ones who were converted Jews who are now Christians, but they dealt more with the culture of the Jews and the law. And so we had the Hellenistic Jews who were converted Jews who were more for the Greek culture and they were a different one. So they thought they weren't as good as them. Do you know sometimes some of the biggest problems is when we think we're better than someone else. Now we'll, we'll, we'll hold our title and we'll shout and we'll make sure everybody knows I was wronged. I was wronged. I was wronged. But what is God getting when we find ourselves in these arguments? I just showed you two Genesis between Lot and Abram. Then I just showed you here how the Jews were in fighting with one another. Now I want to give you one more so you can see this Acts 16. And this one in Acts 16 involves the apostle Paul. Who wrote the New Testament in Acts 16? Watch this. So can I stop and say this real quick? You're not so anointed that you're not at fault. I'll let that marinate. None of us are so saved that we can't mess up and say something or do something to someone where we won't take responsibility. Nobody is there. Acts 16. Let's start reading at verse 36 in Acts 16. They had gone to the council. They were talking about you know, going on and finishing the work, the work of the Lord. And then in verse 36, it says, sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark. He wanted to take John Mark with them. But Paul said he didn't think it was wise to take John Mark. Watch this, because he had deserted them in Pamphylia, and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted. Wait a minute. I, that can't be the Apostle Paul who's writing New Testament. It can't be Paul who's hearing from God, sitting there saying that he didn't want to take somebody. So because he didn't like the person, he didn't want Barnabas to like the person. And now he found himself telling everybody else, we shouldn't take John Mark. And here's what happened right in the middle of the church. Conflict. Right in the middle of God's anointing, conflict. God was sending them out 
on another journey to save folk and they had conflict. Write those three texts down. Genesis 13. Read it yourself. Abram and Lot had a conflict. Man, the Bible just started. Genesis. Then we go in the book of Acts. The reason I took Genesis to Acts is because in Acts, that's where the church had just got anointed. Look what happened. Before they could come together, they're arguing over food. And now Paul is arguing with Barnabas who they should take with them. And God had to separate. Uh-oh. God had to separate Barnabas and Paul. You're still holy, but God said, wait a minute. Do you know that means sometimes God is saying the path that was his perfect path, we, he can't take us on because we can't stand each other. That's right. God said, I cannot take you on that path because you're actually messing up my glory. You're messing up what people need to see. I'm trying to anoint you and make you better, but that's what's happening. Why do these kind of conflicts happen in the church? Now's the time to get your pen and paper. We're going to go through this and I'm going to share with you God's perfect plan for how you are supposed to fight, how you are supposed to deal with disagreements. Some of us have ruined our anointing by not forgiving. We've ruined our anointing by actually thinking that we were right and everybody else was wrong. We've ruined our anointing and we've ruined our church. Churches have split because people can't talk to one another. You speak in tongues, I don't speak in tongues. God is saying, all of this you're doing is not blessing the church. What, where do conflicts come from? Write this down. Let me tell you about conflicts. First of all, conflicts is, is an inability of a person, a believer, to handle their personal sin nature. I'll say it again. It's just that simple. I can go again into a scientific one, but watch this. It's the inability of each person who is a believer to handle their sin nature and they stop being progressively sanctified. Pastor, what are you talking about? Because when you get to the point that you can talk about me and put other people down, put other churches down, don't y'all, don't, don't, don't leave me. Don't, don't shut off tonight because I'm going to be talking real. I'm going to be talking what the Bible says. It's your inability to handle your sin nature. I don't care what someone does to you. We're talking about what you're supposed to do. That's right. Somebody put in the chat those unclean spirits. I, I like somebody's following along with me. Being able to understand your spiritual nature, being able to understand that salvation is progressive, being able to understand that I don't get to the point of salvation constantly. It's something I have to keep progressing through. We're the honest people that will tell you I was I know there was I might have been a lot holier on Monday <laughs> than I am today. Uh, maybe they Friday. Maybe it's Saturday. I'm not I'm not as whole. So we're going to talk about how should Christians fight and deal with it. Write down these type of conflicts. The first conflict you got to deal with is a intra personal conflict. I'm going to spell that I N T R A intra, you know, like intramural sports. That's something that's held within intrapersonal. Watch this. Intrapersonal conflict is just because it's a conflict that you have on the inside of you. Let me give you a great example. If I'm the pastor and I'm watching the ushers usher in new folk and I am just upset by the way they're doing it. I'm upset. I'll give you a great. I'm upset that they won't let anybody come by the down the middle aisle. I'm upset the way they talk to the people. I'm up there getting ready to preach. But now in, I have an internal or intra conflict on the inside of me. And so now when I go to talk to that person, that person doesn't even know nothing's wrong. The manner in which I go to talk to them will tell whether it turns into, here's the next one, an interpersonal conflict. Oh, this is good. Watch this. Sometimes the conflict starts in your mind and you ought to keep it to yourself. Sometimes the problem that you have is just your problem, but you want to take it to make it someone else's problem. And that's when the real problems start is when you take something in your mind that you don't like, that you don't like. I don't like that. I don't like. And you're in God's church, but you will not control your spirit. And because you don't like it, you feel I've got to say something about it. Now, watch this internally with that. You've already passed a judgment. Oh, you've already said that I'm right and that person, you haven't heard their side, haven't heard what they were doing. You don't know why they were doing what they were doing. And yet the conflict was, here's the first word, watch this, intrapersonal. Now 
conflict between two people. Now you go to that person. Man, now it's an interpersonal conflict. And here's the problem with an interpersonal conflict. Sometimes it's not even clean. You know what I mean by not clean? You've already told five other people in the church before you went to that person. Hello? You've already said it to your husband. You already said it to your best friend. Make me sick. Make me sick. I don't know why somebody don't do something about her. I don't know why. Watch this. God is saying now you've turned it into an interpersonal conflict. Watch what happens after that. If enough people get a hold of it, it turns into an interpersonal, interpersonal, intergroup conflict. Here's the bad ones. Intergroup conflict is when now I got the usher board divided. I won't even use Port Norris and Violent. I'll just use the ushers in Port Norris. There's ushers in Port Norris. There was an issue they couldn't agree on. And then half of them agree with one person. Half of them agree with the other person. Now I got the whole usher board in conflict. I don't think we should wear that. Or the deaconesses. I want to wear a hat. I don't want to wear a hat. I want to wear black. I want to wear white. All of that's good until you tear up the church. All of that's good until you make it something that's destroying the church. Stay with me. Here's what God is saying. Interpersonal, intergroup conflicts. Now we're getting to that part where it can even go external. Ooh, stay with me. External is when now folk out there know the problems going on in Shiloh because it's spilled over with a believer. That's external, intergroup. Now the whole church has a problem. And then there is after there's intragroup conflict. Intragroup conflict is again where it may just stay in the women's ministry. So the women's ministry, that's their intra. They're talking with each other. They got a conflict over some stuff. Let me give you some areas what, what manifests out of these four. Here go to four. Very simple. Interpersonal, intergroup. That means more than one. Intrapersonal, that starts with me, spills out to others. And then intra group, where our group gets dysfunctional. It's part of us. The church don't even know about it. But we're not even getting along in our group. Wow. And so what happens? What kind of things make that conflict? First one is content. Conflict. A disagreement over ideas and opinions. Well, you didn't listen to me. Seemed like you always listen to her. Or he doesn't ever take my point, my opinion. Pastor got his favorites. Uh, am I hitting somebody? Pastor got his favorites. He just wanted to do them. And so that turns into a content. I don't like the content of the idea or the opinion, and it caused me a conflict. I can even get to the point where I say, child, let them do what they going to do. I know what my God told me to do. And wrong way to fight. You've just caused a division. You just caused a division because just because you have somebody, you have a scripture for why we should wear hats. Somebody else got a scripture why we shouldn't wear hats, but you're going to push it until everybody in the church believe like you. We should have hats on. Or you got to believe where we shouldn't collect the money here. We should collect the money here. And so what happens, guys, is we got this conflict going on. And at the same time, we're supposed to be worshiping. We are supposed to be following after being made into the image of God. We are the only believers God has. We're the only ones who can carry his word. Some of us are so anointing, but we let those conflicts destroy us. And if you haven't understood, it was for this very nature of Satan, how he got started was pushing people out. How he got kicked out of heaven was grabbing angels and starting a conflict in, in glory. He started a conflict because he didn't agree with God. So the first time, you want to write something down, sometimes I get angry over the content. We're in a meeting and my idea was a better idea, but the meeting didn't decide to go that way. But when you left the meeting, you told three more people your idea was the better idea. A relational conflict. This is a, this is a good one. A relational conflict is a conflict between two people that they may not even like each other's personality. They may not even like for something. You know, we're human. Sometimes we don't like certain people. But watch this. Soon as you get in your mind, I don't like somebody, then you're at a place right now where you already started that intra personal conflict in your mind. But now you're going to put it out into the air where the anointing of God flows. A personal disagreement between two people, that's got to be resolved. So now we have a relationship problem. Here's the craziest thing about relationship problems. You two still may love each other. Wow. You love each other. There's a true statement. I love you, but I don't like you. I mean, there, I, I, you don't know how many times I've heard that from husbands and wives and sometimes friends where, where they're saying, I believe you love me, but you don't act like you like me. 
And all that means is the way you treat me, how we keep this conflict going. The other one is, oh, this is a good one in the church, a process conflict. Process conflict is a disagreement over the way something is done. Now, a lot of times that'll come up to the pastor. You know, we don't like the way we do that. Fine. But if it's in you, I'm going to share with you what to do with a conflict that starts in your mind, your heart, so it doesn't spill out into God the best way God said to handle that. Other times it can be a task conflict. I'm dis I have a disagreement over who you put in charge. Um, they don't know as much as I know, but the group chose them. So here you are now, you got a disagreement with someone because you don't like the tasks that they're assigning. You know, uh, this is the way we're going to do it. This is the task. And you don't agree with it. So you start a problem. And then one of the most dangerous ones is a conflict that is called a cognitive conflict. Here's what I mean. Catch this. You know it's wrong the way you're acting. You know it's wrong the way you're acting. You know enough word to know you shouldn't do that. But it's, you have processed it in your brain so long. It started in your amygdala and went down to your front lobe and started all this emotional problems in your brain. And then all of a sudden, you just exploded. You didn't care what it did to the church. You were looking for your pound of flesh. That's the conflict that will destroy people. How come there are conflicts in the church? The church has these conflicts because we got to be clear that God, first of all, said he wants us to be in peace with one another. Before I can tell you how, you got to know God's, everything I just named, God does not approve of. God does not want you doing those things. How do I know? Write down Romans 14, 19. So then, Romans 14, 19, God said, pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. As soon as you build yourself up and you put other people down, you're losing the blueprint that God has, which makes us powerful enough to defeat the enemy. Romans 14, 19 tell us we got to pursue the things that make for peace and the things that build each other up. Now, it's hard to do that when my mind is so irate and I'm so upset and contentious about what you did to me. So I can't think about your peace. I'm only thinking of my peace. Write down Romans 12, 18. I'm telling you now, God is the one who said we are supposed to be at peace with one another. If you're watching me tonight, you're not on here by accident. God is trying to up, open up your heart, prick your mind to let you know if you have a disagreement with a believer right now, if you have somebody you've thrown away, if you have something you've done that has destroyed the church and you know it was wrong and you haven't rectified it, not only is the kingdom suffering, but my brother and sister, you're suffering. How do I know? Because God said in Romans 12 and 18, watch the text, Romans 12, 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, as it be in you, be at peace with all men. I'm going to read it again. NIV. If possible, so far as you can, be at peace with all men. Here's what God is saying. I know there's a limit because somewhere along the line, you stop your personal sanctification. You stop your progressive sanctification. How do I know that? Because sanctification is something we have to work on until we get the glory. Sanctification is intense. We've been sanctified, right? We are being sanctified, but then we will be sanctified. That means that down here, we will not be totally sanctified. We were sanctified enough that God chose us to be a part of his family. Sanctification means he set us apart. But once he set us apart, we have to now learn and walk and trust and do what his word says. So you, I don't care how long you've been in church. I don't care what your title. You still can be a nasty somebody if you don't control yourself. You still can destroy people if you don't control yourself. You can be the pastor if you don't know how to talk to people. You can be the head usher if you can be the deacon. Any of us who don't realize that if I'm always getting in conflict, something's wrong. Something's wrong when I think everybody's talking about me. <sighs> what you're doing is putting off on other people the way you process stuff. Or you're sitting there saying, uh, I don't know. I don't know why they don't like me. I'm looking at you. But while I'm looking at you, I'm thinking about the fact that Marcia told me to take the trash out before I left and I didn't take the trash out. You took my wayward look 
as looking at you some kind of way. Why are you looking at me like that? That is so, so immature when you get to the point and watch what it's doing to the kingdom of God. Let's be clear. Let me tell you some things God hate. I've been easy on you till then. I told you some things God has for pursue. But let me show you some things God hate. Can you go with me to Proverbs 6, 16 and 19? Listen to God. Now, for our God who is love, for our God who is the epitome of forgiveness and, and understanding and making sure there is a complete reconciliation, for our God to say this, he is warning us. Look what he said. Proverbs 6, 16 and 19. These six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination of him. I'm trying to show you, for those just tuning in, we're talking about how Christians are supposed to fight. We've been fighting wrong and we've been tearing up God's kingdom. Watch Proverbs 6, 16, 19. It says, here are the things God hate. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that divides wicked imagination, Feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaks lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. You know the one thing that text has in has going through it, the flow, the pattern, it's all about you. Me. It don't say anything in there about your brother. It don't say anything about that sister you don't like. It has God said and God didn't say nothing about here's your license to hate them because no, all God said is make sure you don't have a proud look. Make sure you don't have a lying tongue. Make sure you don't shed innocent blood. You do know first John talks about murder. Okay, we're not talking about sometimes spiritual murder is worse than physical murder. Some some of you guys are hit men. You got a rabbit tongue. You done killed off a whole you done killed off ushers, you done killed off. Choir members, you, you just done kill folk off because what happens is when we start speaking, we shed innocent blood because we didn't go in there and try to stop the conflict. I have people who've been mad at me for something that I didn't know. You know, one of the craziest things in the world is I didn't say I didn't do it. I probably, the Bible says in a multitude, uh, uh, multitude of words um, that there's going to be some trouble. Right. Sin is not lacking is what the text says in a multitude of words. Sin is not. So I may have said something that touched an open wound in your life, something that you thought it was insensitive to you. But my God, my brother and sister, can you I'm going to show you what God said to do with that. How are you mad at me? And I don't know it. How are you going out telling other people about it? And I don't know it. How are you? Maybe there's something you didn't like in your sister since you've been a member and you still. You know, you do some fake, fake love in front of them, but you still don't like them and you're constantly talking about them and you don't realize the damage you're doing to your own soul. Oh, I haven't even hit on the other scriptures that God says, how are we supposed to fight? Let me tell you why we do what we do. You're going to like this part. Why do I do what I do? I want to give you four biblical warnings to show you why we have this propensity to talk about people. Now, please understand so I don't have to keep saying this. I'm bleeding just as much as you are. <laughs> All right. I, 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 God, I can't teach this with you. I got to teach this with we because this is a us thing. I have to control myself like you do. But if we both, if we all know that, we can cut each other some slack. Can somebody please write in the chat, cut some slack, cut your brother some slack, at least back off long enough for me to heal. And then we'll know what's going on. Watch this. Uh, the first reason that we have this propensity to fight is because of 1 John 2, 15, 16. We are carnal in our walk. 1 John 2, 15, 16 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Is not this of the Father? This is not of the Father, but of the world. Here's what God's saying. And you know yourself, you need to check and say, am I a carnal Christian? You say, well, no, I, I study the word. I'm not carnal. Yeah, that's cool when you're in church. And that's cool when you're teaching. But how do you treat people when you're not doing those things? Mm. Carnal just means that my flesh, some of my BC sins that I still have to keep under, under check. You do know that there are some sins you're going to get rid of and some sins you got to fight all your life. 
Somebody said, but didn't I, didn't I get it? I went to the altar and, and they put oil and lay hands on me so I could get rid of that sin. That's cool. But when you got done, you went back to it. I can't, God can't pull something off that you speak with your words. Your words has brought you back to this place. And here's the worst thing of all. You feel justified in talking what you're talking. You feel justified. Some kind of way, it don't even bother you. You can talk about your brother all night, then come in church and praise God and even tell me you got touched. Oh, nothing was high today. But what happened to your heart? Here's the second one. It's our sin nature. What, what do I mean by our sin nature? The second one. First one is our carnal. Second one is never forget you have a sin nature. I had a brother tell me one time, well, the Bible says when we got saved, we were free from sin. I want to know, yes, past tense, present tense, future tense. When we got set free, we got set free, forgiven for all of our sins. But it does not mean we can't commit sins while we're still in this flesh. And, and the, the stupidity of that to me, the craziest of that is, you can't show me somebody in the Bible. You can't find anyone. Somebody, one time somebody said to me, said, well, Job, no, Job committed sin also. Job committed the sin of trying to walk in perfection. There's some believers right now who have hurt other believers, believing that you had reached a standard that nobody else has reached. And you talk down to other people about where they are thinking that, well, I'm better than them. But you haven't realized this. As soon as you started talking down, you misplaced who you thought you were. As soon as you got to that point. So here's what Romans says. It says, for we know that the law is spiritual. Listen to this. But I am carnal, sold unto sin. Paul speaking for all of us. For that which I do, I don't allow. That's what I want to do. I want to do this. I, I, in my mind, I think I'm this, but I don't act like I'm this all the time. For what I would do, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do not. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it. This is the Bible. Can't argue with God. But sin that dwelleth in me. Brothers and sisters, remember there is always indwelling sin on the inside of you. And you have to know that I, when, I'm, when I'm talking to somebody... I've done it many a time. I'm not the only one. How many have spoken a word and wish you could take it back? Because before you know it, you, you, you were thinking one thing and then you just blurted it out. And what you thought about, you said it. And then and I'll tell you, husbands, you've seen this a lot. Wives say to us, you better watch your tone. And, and so in our mind, we're thinking, well, I didn't say nothing. You got to know how brothers think. I didn't do that. But all of a sudden, say, watch your tone. Because what I said and what you did was not what you thought you were doing, but it came out wrong. Many of us have found ourselves, and what we have to do is learn how to help each other when we get in that situation by not going ballistic and turning it into a conflict, especially if somebody says something. As soon as they say it, they say, I'm sorry. Now, if they do it again, that's going to be something you got to deal with. But here's what I'm saying is don't turn into a conflict. So first of all, why we do this is because of uh, we can be carnal in our walk. Secondly, it's because of indwelling sin, especially those who think they have no sin. The next one is the present state of our culture. Don't ever think that the culture and environment around me does not dictate to me how I act. I have to fight off acting like the world. I have to fight off doing the things that the world does. Um, you know, I got to fight when you know, I'm going to mess somebody up. But when the lottery gets to around, somebody say, there's a 69 million. Somebody say, well, Pastor, you too holy to be thinking about the lottery. Well, 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 sometimes in my mind, I'm thinking, man, if I had that $69 million, and then we say stuff like, I'd pay the church off. Yeah, I might do that. But I might drive up here. Let me, let me quit. Let me back up. Let me back up. Let me back up. What I'm saying to you is always know that the culture and environment around us is what help. also we have to fight through so that we don't become carnal. What's what, look what James 4 and 4 said. Now, I like this word. God's word is so true. He said, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity? Separation with God. Therefore, which, whosoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Watch what I'm telling you. 
And, you know, I, I, I saw the Saint buying a lottery ticket one day and they looked at me and, you know, they didn't know I was going to say, hey, you know, you heard that Kit Kat commercial, right? Break me off a piece of that Kit Kat bar. Just break me off a little bit. But anyway, they saw me and they were buying their ticket. I said, look, don't worry about that because that's going to be between you and God. All I want you to do is pay your tithes. Ten, big old 10%. <laughs> Let's go. The next thing that makes us like this, watch this, is the level of spiritual warfare we are experiencing. I'm going to get serious for a moment. When you feel bad constantly, when you're in the middle of a struggle that you've been in a year, two years, maybe you've been in five years, maybe there's something the way people have treated you. Do you know when you're in spiritual warfare, you have more propensity to get angry with people, to get evil with people? Not to hear anything. And sometimes because people seem to be insensitive to what you're going through, then you find yourself um, saying stuff about how they're acting. And the reality is your spiritual warfare is making you cold and callous and not friendly. I'm going to give you a secret. If you can embrace somebody else's pain, oh, this is good. While you're in pain, you can win your spiritual warfare. But we do the opposite. I'm hurting so much. So we get to this point. I don't want nobody to say nothing to me. Don't bother me today. We all said it. I don't want nobody to say nothing. No, not today. Don't say anything to me. And the reality is that if you would embrace that, you could get that spirit, that dark spirit off of you by embracing people. There are some people right now, the devil have in bondage because they don't like somebody. And I'm not going to even throw, you know, like, uh, throw this verse on you because we, we don't really listen to the ram the parameters of this verse. But there's a verse in 1 John say, how can you say you love God who you've never seen and can't even love your brother who you see? We throw that away because the reality is pain makes us try to, it, it leads us to a place where we may not handle conflicts properly. Now watch this. What are the results of me not handling the conflict properly? Here's the first one. Watch me. Pride. Write it down. People, you know what pride does? Pride means, um, I'm trying to, sometimes when I'm prideful, I'm putting up a fence and a gate and a wall because I don't really want you to know how bad I'm feeling. So I just, you know, I, I keep acting like I'm acting. I put my pride on. Pride says people often behave with self-centeredness, ego and pride. And that way, when they get to that part, They'll get their feelings hurt easily. It, 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 it happens on the inside of me. Look at James 4 and 1. James 4 and 1 says, where do fights and quarrels among you come from? Look what God said. They come from your selfish desires that are at war in your bodies. Don't they? God said, most of us have a war going on inside of us. We want to be nice people. We want to be the kind of people we think we are. But that war going inside of us can get us to a place of spiritual immaturity. Then there is spiritual, emotional immaturity. Immaturity, watch this. When I get spiritual, emotional immaturity, it comes from me being so prideful. And if I, under, if I really understood something, can I say this to everybody? If you are smart... If you are healthy, if you are able to learn and be intelligent and pick up a skill and you've endowed yourself with all of these talents and if you have natural talents, listen to me. God gave them to you. God is the only one who gets the glory. Pride says, I deserve the glory for what I'm going through. That's why there's a whole lot of intelligent people. Your IQ does not determine how successful you are in life. There's a whole lot of smart people that turn prideful and angry and nasty and people can't be around them because when pride, you don't have room for other people to say anything. You're loving on yourself constantly and you take it out on people when they don't do when they don't do what you want them to do. Now, uh, because time is winding up, I want to get to one of the scriptures that gives the remedy for what God says. I got a whole lot more to teach. You got to make it next week, but I want to keep you going by letting you see what God says. So I'm going to do one more and that's some people can't stand change and inflexibility. Uh, Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man lays a snare, 
but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. All right, now, how do I resolve the conflict? Let's get real for a minute. And then I'm going to show you there's about five particular principles in Scripture that I'm going to be hitting on in, this, in these lessons in the next coming week that tell us what and how to fight. You got to know you're going to fight, but it tells us how and what to fight, how to fight like God wants us to fight. So I'm reading now, or this first process, I'm taking from a book called The Peacemaking, The Peacemaker by um, a guy named, I'll get his name for you, but the book is called The Peacemaker. And so the first thing he said, if you really are being serious about wanting to resolve conflicts and not being a person that's caught in conflicts, not thinking you're right all the time, not believing that because I'm holy, I don't make a mistake, not believing that the devil is not in, in, influencing me, understanding what the enemy's trying to do. He's trying to part brothers and sisters. He's trying to part fathers and daughters, fathers and sons. He's trying to part church. He wants to part the best of friends and he does it by getting us in conflict. And I just went through all the reasons conflict come, but I want you to know, here's the first thing you got to do if you want to resolve that conflict. This first one is good, but listen to it. He does something called the four G's of peacemaking. Somebody put that in the chat for me. The four G's of peacemaking. The four G's of peacemaking. All right, here's what it says. The first G, and this one should knock everything out of the park. When you're in the middle of your argument, while the frown is on your face, while the high and mighty you're rehearsed in your mind, how much you hate the person, the first thing you ought to know is, does my behavior glorify God? Write it down. That, that, is, the, that is a primary one. Does the behavior I'm distributing, this, I mean, I'm showing, displaying, does that, glorify God. Now, I'm not talking about who did what to you. What you're doing right now, does your behavior in any way glorify God? 1 Corinthians 10.31 tells us that we ought to please God. How can we please God? Write it down. If your actions are so, if you're so right and they did you so wrong, God is not saying you're not right that they did you wrong. It's kind of confusing, but you know what I'm saying. You may be right. I did do you wrong, but that's me. You got to control your actions. So you got to ask yourself, if not talking to her, if rolling my eyes at him, if not trying to, if not doing a good deed for them, you know, somebody said, I'm so mad at that person that if, if they were on fire, I wouldn't even throw water on them. Christians say stuff out of their mouth like that. Or you can make judgments and assumptions, say stuff like, uh, well, I know they're not any good. How do you know? The only person you only know is you. So God is saying, if we were to cut all this scene down, this argument that you had with the trouble, if you got on your knees, can you honestly say how I'm acting is glorifying God? You can only glorify God in the midst of a conflict is by trusting him and honoring him to be the peacemaker in this situation. You got to say, other than that, you, you will excuse yourself all day long, but is what you're doing glorifying God? We'll talk about these principles a little more next week, but second G, write it down. The second G is, here it is, get the log out of your own eye first. Get the log out of your own eye first. Matthew 7 and 5. You hypocrite. It's Jesus talking. You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye then you will see clearly to remove a speck from your brother's eye. Wow. Did you get that? Did you get that? I'm trying to tell you how to fight. So first of all, if I'm walking up to you with this big log in my, I'm getting ready to lay you out. I'm getting ready to tell you off. It has marinated and simmered in my mind all night. I, I, I'm glad you left the church. I'm glad you ain't. She needs to get up. I'm, oh, I'm so glad. I didn't do anything, but I'm glad they go. I'm glad they moved around that position. I, you forgot. You're just growing that log in your own eye. First of all, it doesn't glorify God. But secondly, you look at something else. You got to deal with the law. Can I tell you something else to you? 
when you first, if you're the kind of person who constantly gets in conflict, then you're the kind of person who constantly gets in conflict. And if you're the kind of person who constantly gets in conflict, you know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about a person who is always in the middle of a mess. You got to know that that's your log. Somewhere along the line, I mean, some other folk might have had a, a, you know, a little twig in their eye when they came to you, but you turned it into a log. Get the log out of your own eye before you come and chastise me. Before you tell me what's wrong, you'll never win me over when you come with all the anger and all the part, all the part of you that's in you. So you got to get the log out of your. See, God is saying that 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 is blinding you. You're prejudice to this situation. You're, you're, you're thinking you're right in this situation. You're pain in this situation. What you want to happen in this situation, it blinds you. So when you run to someone else, you actually um, make them more angry because you can't control yourself. So before you come running to me, make sure you remove the log out of your eye. First G, glorify God. That should shut it down. The second G is I got to get that log out of my own eye. And, I, and I'm going to go through all of that later. But here's the next one. The third G. Gently restore. Gently restore. Matthew 18, 15. If your brother. Matthew 15, 18. If your brother sins against you. Go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you. Gently restore is not making faces every time you see me. It's not telling other people about how I wronged you. It's not finding ways to hurt me. It's, it, it's, it's none of those things. If You got to make sure. I don't know a person around who backed in a corner will not fight. Now, remember, on, on top end, I'm telling you, you're the believer. We're the believers. We're trying to keep God's church together. But the reality is, you know, I could tell you, you know, we don't understand sometimes when Jesus says, Father, forgive them because they know not what they do. Now, of course, Jesus has more maturity, spiritual maturity than all of us. Um, and you don't want to miss because next week I'm going to talk to you about emotional intelligence. We understand IQ, quotient, uh, IQ intelligence or mind intelligence or, you know, we under, but we don't understand sometimes emotional intelligence intelligence. Emotional intelligence is when we get mature enough to understand some things should just not make me go off. <laughs> some things I've been through enough that I should not act like it's the end of the world because somebody did it to me. Some things I should be able to just, I should be able to keep on eating my dinner. It should not even touch me. I should be in a place where if I heard so-and-so talked about me, I got to wait until so-and-so comes and confront me. I'm not going to go out and chase the rumors. I'm not going to chase what somebody else said. And if somebody come and bring me a bone, I don't want to talk to them because that means, you know the old saying, if a dog will bring a bone, they'll take a bone. You better quit trusting people who bring you a bone. You better quit trusting folk who say, girl, I got your best interest at heart. I'm telling you, you ought to, it's a shame. It's a shame what they said about you. No, what you're doing is you're trying to start a conflict because you got that little whispering thing going on. You know, that's demonic, right? Can you say it out loud? Say it in the dark. That's something that's going to keep conflict going and let the darkness continue and some kind of way you might be vicariously trying to hurt me because you don't like me so all you're doing is telling me what somebody else said because it justified inside of you what you don't like about me so what happens is we can't be restored if you're coming at me wrong what's the first g glorify god what's the second g make sure i get that log out of my eye. Make sure that the emotional, the you know, the nastiness, the swag, all that stuff is out of me. And then third G is gently restore. Here is the fourth G, and this will really bless you. After you calm yourself down, go and be reconciled. What'd you say, Pastor? Forgive. I didn't say that. The scripture said, 
forgive. Now, listening to forgiveness, sometimes it's not a two-way street. This is some tough stuff right here, guys. This, this hits me. I have to forgive you even if you don't forgive me. I have to love you even if you don't love me. Christian's talking about, I forgave him once. I'm sorry. Seven times 70 in one day. I'll take it further. Knowing what I know about God, God wants you to forgive them in, into impertuity. If you don't know what impertuity is, impertuity is into eternity. It means forever. So I said, well, I forget. I'll forgive, but I ain't going to forget. That's your problem. How are you going to tell, how are you going to use that phrase, I forgive, but I ain't going to forget when you want to forget all the pain in your life and you pray, God, remove this out of, remove this pain from me. Lord, take me, let me move on. How come you want God to remove stuff and not let you remember it, but you want to forgive and still remember it? That just means you're going to come back and start another conflict in the church. And this time you're going to be ready for bear. I know I already forgave that hussy one time. Oh, I'm sorry. We, you know, this is scripture. This, this is Bible study. I'm just trying to talk like you guys talk. I've heard all this. I already forgave him once. And then you'll go and run them down again. Is God glorified when you don't talk to a sister who may be in need? Is God glorified when you Balk leadership by going home and talking about something the pastor did that you didn't like instead of going to the pastor. I'm going to take you to Jesus's six steps of reconciliation. I was just giving you the, the, the platform to understand something. But there are six steps in the Bible that Jesus laid out himself to teach you to be reconciled spiritually. But if we're going to fight, we're going to fight. We are going to fight. But if we're going to fight the way God said fight, then what we need to understand is I got to make sure that I can cut this off by glorifying God. First step. No way will God ever, ever tell me how I'm talking to my sister and brother brings him glory. Not after all he forgave me for. I got to also understand then, I'm going to get very close, that I got a log in my eye. I don't know what it is. I mean, I, I, I'm, in, I'm in heavy spiritual warfare. I didn't just didn't like the way you touched me today. All that's good, but it's not my fault. Make sure you get that log out of your own eye. If you can only see what I did, but you can't see what you did, you definitely got a problem. And then thirdly, go and be reconciled. Gently. I mean, th excuse me. Thirdly, make sure that you gently restore. You know, restoration start. I got to restore myself first, then go try to restore my brother. But then I got to be reconciled. Now, reconciliation, I saved that for last because that means you like me again. Hello. You know, we've been reconciled, right? Through the death of Jesus Christ, we've been reconciled to God. That means we're family again. You cannot function in God's church if you're going to be the person that holds conflicts. And don't let them go. God bless you. It's Pastor Duncan's. Uh, thank you. The name of this lesson, share it with someone, is how to fight. And how Christians are to resolve and handle their conflicts. Um, don't forget, Shiloh, that um, uh, Saturday, we've closed everything up. So Saturday morning, we have our annual training session. Hope to see you there. Everybody have a blessed night. Let me say a prayer. Father God, I thank you tonight that we've all found ourselves where we allowed our conflicts to keep us up at night. We're laying in our bed and thinking of ways to tell somebody off. Or, or we're so hyped, emotionally hyped, that we can't even sleep at night. There's pain and stress going through our lives. All because we won't go and handle our conflicts the way God said handle them. We got to be the peacemaker. We got to make sure, first of all, God understands. I may get mad, but I'm going to go back and, glor and glorify God. To make sure he gets the glory in the last say. Lord, I thank you for everyone on this line tonight. Whatever they're going through, let them get into their word and realize the only person they can change is themselves.
In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Have a great night. Don't forget, next week we're going to do our second session and um, help God's church. God bless.